everyone. Welcome to the Captain Sandy and Leah Ray show. I am so excited to have our guest, Megan Olivi, um, joining us today. Um, she is, I'm going to read it because there's, she's such a badass that there's so much that I couldn't memorize all of it. But she's a sports broadcaster, a journalist, and a host who is best known for her work as a reporter and host for the Ultimate Fighting Championship, UFC, which I personally love, actually. And um, she is also very known for her interviews and reporting, so feel free to interview us if you want to. (laughs) (laughs) And I love, but what stood out the most for me personally um, is you are a huge advocate for mental health awareness and sobriety and and that is near and dear to our hearts so welcome hey thank you so much for having me yes Yes, thank you and thank you for being patient with us yes i'm patient oh no i mean patience is not usually one of my best virtues but today it was very easy because i was excited to come on so no problem (laughs) i'm glad awesome yeah because i had to change my tops you know, I got to go back and do a wardrobe to. change for all the I keep the same shirt <laughs> oh, on. <laughs> you can tell. Yeah. <laughs> I totally have the same clothes on. No, no, no. She changes. I don't. That's well, so funny. Well, you look perfect. So no matter what, you guys are killing it. <laughs> yeah. So tell, like, I'm just curious to know, like, how did how did you get your start in broadcasting? Did you go to Are school you? for it? Did you always know you wanted to go into that industry? Yeah, I, it's funny because I grew up loving sports. And so I would watch, you know, I'm from New Jersey. So I would watch the Yankees and the Giants religiously. But for me, honestly, I never, ever even thought about a career in sports. For some reason, it wasn't that I didn't think I could do it. It just never even came into my brain. So I originally wanted to do political science. I wanted to work in campaigns and I was interning in New York City and I would always talk to the guys at my internship about, you know, the the game the night before. And finally they were like, why don't you just work in sports? Like you love it. You're passionate about it. Why don't you do this? And so when I started kind of looking into it a little bit more, I realized that was a real possibility for me. I was very fortunate that I had the opportunity to sort of try some things. Um, I did a few little internet shows here and there where I could discuss sports and I loved it. And so I did I did want to make sure that I had the education to back up what I wanted to do because it's such a competitive field. So I went and got my master's degree um, to ensure that I, you know, could could put the backing behind it. Hey, I've also studied this. I don't just like it, but, you know, I have a degree to, to prove to you that I take it really seriously. And so... Yeah, I just kind of started at the very bottom doing really, really small gigs, even, I mean, literally getting people coffee at 4.30 in the morning as well, <laughs> and just sort of worked up through there. And, and I'm glad I did because I feel like learning every step of the process instead of skipping, you know, some of those things has really made me who I am and how I want to treat people. I understand what PAs are going through and and different stuff like that. So I, I'm really fortunate for it, but it all just kind of worked out it, it was serendipity, I guess. I, I wish I could say, like, I always wanted to be yeah. a sports reporter. I, I didn't until I did. That's pretty awesome. Is it like a Jersey thing? Because you said I'm from New Jersey. So it's like, is Jersey known to be sports yeah, you know, fans? Yeah, we, we love sports and we just love competing, like in anything. Mm-hmm. And I feel very fortunate uh, that I was raised over there. And, you know, I worked in New York City for, for years because... It kind of instills this sort of rat race in you, like no one settles. Everybody is hustling. And then now I live on the West Coast where things are much calmer, but that that work ethic is still very much inside of me. So I'm glad to sort of have the balance of both things. So uh, did you have brothers or your dad? Because I have brothers that are like obsessed with sports and they can name all the stats and stuff. And I, so did you grow up in that? Because yeah, so I have a brother who's 10 years older than me and a sister who's 12 years older than me. And so- They were both athletes. Um, My brother, he was a very, very talented wrestler, um, wrestled on Team Fox Catcher and Team USA. So, you know, the fact that he was 10 years older than me, I I grew up around that. And so it was just second nature. And I played sports my whole life. My neighbors, all of us, we were always, you know, giving each other black eyes or skin in Uh, our knees, doing whatever. What did you play? What sports did you play? uh, I was a gymnast and I played softball. So me too, I uh, I played softball. Yeah, yeah, it was was the best. And right now I'm trying to get some of my friends from UFC to join a softball league this summer here in Vegas. So we'll see if it happens. (laughs) So are you based in Vegas or? um... Yeah, I'm based in Vegas. I've lived here for about 12 years now. I, I moved from New York City. I got offered a job out here to cover the UFC. I didn't know anybody. Um, it was making a little bit more money than New York, but your money goes much further here. Um, and yeah. so 
I decided to just take a risk. I, I said, I'll give myself a year. If it doesn't work out, I can always move back. And it'll be fine. And yeah, that was 12 years ago. So never moved back. That's, That's pretty amazing. Cool. Bravo Con is going to be in Vegas this year. Oh Do my God, that? don't I know? Oh, yes. <laughs> my best friend Lindsay and I are obsessed with Bravo. We cannot wait for Bravo Con to be here. If you guys need recommendations, I got you. Yeah. I think it's the best city for it because there's a million hotels and venues and things to do in in the strip so you don't have to like travel too far and there's not a ton of traffic you can walk most places so i think it'll be great yeah it's so definitely awesome. oh yeah definitely will hopefully we'll see you yes so in the sports crossed. world because i have a friend like she was in media for years and she always wanted she wanted to be you you know like she wanted that but her journey took her a different way she managed a news station um did you have pushback did you make a comeback did you have to take a step back how did you forge forward and grab a mic and do sports when it's a male-dominated industry? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. For me, it was sort of fake it until you make it. Um, yeah. That's huh? that's really what I had to do. Mm -hmm. I always felt like I just needed to control the things I could control, which is the effort I put into my preparation and the attitude that I come with to every job. And so my thing was, hey, nobody's going to be able to outwork me. I'm going to make sure that I have more information than everyone else that I have worked harder to prepare than anyone else and the rest I will you know sort of leave into fate because once an interview starts you guys know you can't control really where it goes where you just goes, have yeah. to be ready for whatever path that conversation takes and so for me it was just like hey I might be young but no one is going to ever question my work ethic and so I would always be as prepared as humanly possible and then you know make sure I was always treating people well and that, that was sort of my recipe to continue forward you know it was a little it was a little unique in the beginning because there weren't very many women covering the sport of mixed martial arts and there weren't even women competing in the ufc at that point and so it was definitely uh an outlier but it once i opened my mouth and i was asking questions and people realized like oh she's not just here you know to check a box she's really here because she's the best one at the job that I think um, it never really became a question of gender anymore. But, you know, you, you find yourself, I'm sure you guys feel this, you find yourself sometimes in rooms where people don't even realize the conversation could be, you know, skewed one way for us. And you're like, okay, and I'm still here. Uh -huh. But you, we just kind of have to, to go with the flow and, and you, you, you sort of figure out how to make it work and have people look at you as just a talent instead of like the woman on the team. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's important. You know, you along the way you learn how to read people, how to respond, how to really fit in any personality um, setting, right? And yeah, and be quick on your feet. You got to think really fast. Um, yes, and that's a talent. That's a gift that not everybody has. And and it is all about networking and getting to know people and relationship based, right? It really is who you know as well as being prepared. And yeah, you, I I think so. Yeah. Were you embraced by the networks? Like, of course, you were hired, but, you know, when you're standing on the field with all the other networks and the, how, what is that like? What was it like or what is it like? You know, it was interesting at the beginning there. Um, I was, especially in, in mixed martial arts, I was one of like two or three women who would kind of be in the scrums or the big group settings. And we all stuck together. Um, I'm really fortunate to have those women who had welcomed me with open arms and then I could do the same for whoever joined us. But, um, you know, after those those first couple of days or couple of, of events, it never really was um, questioned anymore. I was pretty welcomed. You'd always have people here and there, which yeah. you get in the, in the industry who maybe aren't the most welcoming or, or have judgment judgments on certain things. But um, I think the way I conducted myself always always made me welcome and and people were happy to have me around and so um I I didn't really receive any negative stuff and then when I moved I also cover the NFL this will be my sixth season upcoming um I I do the NFL on Fox on Sundays and so you know that is like a crazy different world from what I do but it's you know Fox welcomed me with open arms they they asked me to join the team and and when I did you know and I, I started working the sidelines now I have all these friends from different networks and and different teams and I'm so happy to see them whenever the, the teams that I'm covering face one another and so it's always been a really positive thing but I think that whoever 
whoever is on that path, you control a lot of that. You know, how you treat people, how you come prepared, what sort of attitude you have, how helpful you are to those around you. And I think once people realize like, hey, you're you're essentially a good person, then usually 99% of everyone else is really receptive. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And a lot of Red Bull. <laughs> coffee on my end. A lot of I'm a coffee drinker. <laughs> There's a lot of <laughs> early mornings in in at those games. You had to have their sound check. You got to be there at like seven in the morning. Yes, and yes. So you early take mornings care of yourself and late nights for fights. I mean, on an East Coast fight, sometimes right. I don't leave the venue till like four in the morning. So right. yeah, it's it's a it's a lot of coffee on my end. <laughs> yes, so yeah. You have to do self care, right? Yeah. We just sing the national anthem. Oh, uh, at the NFL games, yeah. yeah. Amazing. Yeah, it's hopefully, fun. hopefully I'll work the... one where you're there. Yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah, she sang in front of two, two a million people. Oh yeah, it was when um, we went to the AFC game against uh, Tom Brady's the Boston. Amazing. And, uh, Patriots. I mean, Patriots, yeah. and it's Boston. Yeah, yeah. See? I mean, I sing the anthem. and That's uh, incredible. Yeah, and so we we won the Super Bowl, and so here in Colorado, it was a million people that came out, too, because Manny was retiring after, you know, it was a 50-year anniversary, and I had no idea, wow. and I just came out uh, outside, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, there's, like, a million people all the way to the Capitol, and focus like you know and it was so emotional and someone thought you were paula abdul oh on the afc game david spade said oh hey paula abdul just sang the national anthem and i'm like okay yeah no <laughs> but thanks he died yeah. like, it was like straight up yeah i love it <laughs> you know i think it's um there was something that you said about you know um when you show up in a way uh, and you you're giving you 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 learn your craft you know your job you're helpful people are more open to that that is such a great message because so many people out there if you actually learn your job be kind be helpful you're not going to have issues and if you do it's going to be that one percent right exactly exactly and I think it can be a little scary especially for women in a male-dominated field as you could attest to sometimes you almost feel like you have to do those things on a bigger scale than maybe our male colleagues. But, um, you know, because there's judgments or there's biases, whatever it may be, when it, as soon as you step into a room before you even have the chance to open your mouth or do something. But I think just, just being the person that you need is always come back to me tenfold. And I just feel like it's, it's opened doors and it's made other people feel comfortable and welcome. And at the end of the day, that's really all I'm working towards is, is to do the best job I can and to help you know, people who want to do the same thing as me feel welcomed and comfortable and able to do the job as well. Yeah. So did did you always love UFC or is this new to you? Did you have to learn it? Um, that world? A little bit of both. I mean, because my brother's older than me and he was such a talented wrestler, I, I already understood a, a large amount about the sport. My grandfather and my great uncle were both boxers. Um, and so wow. combat sports was just something in my, my household that we didn't even think twice about and so I understood a lot of it there were nuances that certainly I had to learn um but it was it was pretty easy for me to just sort of seamlessly go into there but again I'm, I'm sort of a lifetime student so I also really took it seriously what are the things that I don't know and 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 how do I ensure that that foundation is built with no cracks um and so that I really understood the basis of you know our sport and our weight classes our rules and that kind of stuff and then oh this discipline jujitsu or karate or or um you know taekwondo whatever it may be that I wasn't super familiar with that I was educating myself as much as possible and that education just continues every single day yeah I love the lifetime student that is such a great takeaway from this yeah. is remain teachable be a lifetime student you don't need to know everything about everything all the time it's impossible and to have that way of thinking really just lets a lot of people off the hook. It's like, I don't know, but I can learn and I'm just going to continue to learn. Yeah. And why not evolve and elevate your skill set? I mean, it's a detriment to think that like you're settled in there or you've plateaued. What What's the point of that? You know, for me, I, I'm always trying to reach the next level or do the next thing. I'm never really comfortable just as is. And mm -hmm. so I think just that desire to continue to learn is, is always like a really positive flame that's burning within you that will never hinder you in your life in any in any sphere, whether it's professionally or personally. And so it's, it's something I 
try and take with me every day. You know, some days I'm like, oh, I yeah. wish I just knew everything, but you know. Right. <laughs> and preparation, right? Like what you do. I mean, I rem- at that AFC game that I was singing at, it was, they don't really film the anthem live most of the time, unless it's a championship game, right? Or a Super Bowl or something. So it was, my monitor goes out in the middle of me singing on live television. Like I literally heard a pop in my ear and I could have freaked out and I could have been like, but you just, I knew it so well and I knew how to handle it that it just kept going. Like nothing ever happened and only I noticed. Um, but it was all those years, even that minute, 20 seconds, um, all those years I it took to prepare for that moment, how to handle an arena of people and live television, you know, and not freak out. And so same with you. I mean, it's, it's you evolve and you learn and you learn how to handle things in life and it's overcoming your fears of what the possibilities that it could happen you know and how do you prepare yourself for those times yeah and live tv is a beast like we always we always try to have perfect shows but we're on the air for eight hours and like you're never gonna be perfect and you're never so perfect the, yeah striving for perfection is great but understanding like the viewers at home don't know half the things that are going on no. behind the scenes and so just keep going it just keep faking it until you make it yeah like, exactly that, that's all we can do Exactly. And like, you, I love your story of, of what you taking over, Cap, you know, Captain Lee at the time um, and going into it. Will you tell that? Tell it. She yeah, hasn't so heard that story. Do you watch uh, Below Deck season 10 when oh, I took yeah. over Captain Lee? Okay. So, She's like, apparently oh, yeah. my dog did too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, <"Well>, you- <laughs> <laughs> So when I saw the boat, biggest boat I ever ran, I was really nervous. The wind was really blowing and it's a lot of tonnage. And I was at the dock and um, behind me was champion gold medalist hall of famer gg fernandez tennis pro wow and filming me the camera's in front of me filming me and i thought to myself the camera in front of me is actually wondering if i'm going to leave the dock or not because i was waiting for the gust of wind to stop and then in my mind i was thinking but if i hit the rocks well that's going to kill the season and if this happens i'm going to put the boat over there so i was thinking about all these scenarios what ifs and then when I looked over my shoulder and I saw Gigi and I thought what she went through to win those gold medals, I got to take this boat off the dock. <laughs> That's amazing. Yes. And so I did. And it's just walking through that. Um, yeah. You're so you, we have mentioned mental health and uh, uh-huh. you're close to recovery. And I'm just curious, like that journey. Yeah. So my husband, Ben has actually been uh, sober for 17 years. I'm going on 18 this summer. Yeah. Um, he just retired from the UFC. He was a professional mixed martial artist for 15 years. And, um, you know, when I met him, I, I was never like a big drinker. I was just a, a casual drinker. But when I met him, I just cared about him so much. And I understood that that journey is fragile and the most important person or the most important thing in his life. Like, sobriety comes before anything else and so I was just kind of like why if I care about him so much am I not committed to this journey 100% as well and so I decided you know hey I care about him and I don't want to um, you know ever jeopardize any of that so I just decided to to not ever drink again and that was probably like 12 years ago um and it's been great I mean we still have a great time and he knows that I'm with him 100% every step of the way I mean even on our wedding day people were in the bridal suite you know drinking champagne and I he wasn't there he would have no idea but for me it's like no this is this is a commitment I made to him and he he can't ever have alcohol again and so why should I like we are we're a partnership um we have the same goals in life and for me it was just important to to maintain that sobriety with him and and I'm really I'm very fortunate I haven't I I didn't struggle with addiction in the same manner that he did but um I never wanted him to feel alone my brother is sober as well for about the same amount of time as my husband and you know his journey was a little bit different and I just wanted to be as supportive as I could and for for us that was the right thing being able to have your partner wake up on New Year's Day and go for a workout and not be hungover or, you know, not worry about, hey, they're drinking in this casual setting where I feel a little nervous. 
but they don't because they have some, you know, some lubrication there. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's, it's just been the best thing for us. Um, and for somebody who is a partner, you know, a, a wife to somebody who, who struggled for a long time, it is absolutely for me, I, I unthinkable to be anywhere else in our sobriety journey. Like I, I, the only way I can support him is, is being his partner and walking that same journey with him. And so that, that's what we've done. And, and I wouldn't change it for the world. I love that. I love that. And along with that is mental health, right? Like I've yeah. gone through Sandy's journey and going to just a couple of meetings with her that it's all in the thinking and in the mind and constantly feeding that. And right. Like that's yeah, a really beautiful thing. Yeah. It's, um, you know, it's so interesting because there's a big mental health awareness thing happening now. And I remember I went to my first meeting many, many years ago. And uh, I wish I could say I got it on the first one, but it took me quite a few How years. How long to have you been it. sober now? Then? 33 years. 33 years. Yeah. Oh my God, that is incredible. Yeah. Congratulations. It's, but for the grace of God, there go I, you know, like honestly. Um, but I, we were taught, and I, I sometimes I want to change the, the wording that you, a guy summed it up for me. If you have a drunk horse thief and you sober him up, what do you have? A horse a, thief. Yeah. He's just a sober one. He hasn't changed. He's just removed the alcohol, right? So you got to change. Once you remove the substance, whatever you're masking, you got to change that. And they would say we suffer from a mental illness masked by, right? So whatever we're trying to uh, figure out in the mental illness, I always think about this. It's a mental, your brain's a muscle, everything that you do, you exercise, it's a muscle, it's routine, it's rote, it's something that you practice. And if you want to change your body, you go to the gym, you work out, same thing with sobriety. If you want to maintain that, and whatever recovery path you're on, you do the work, you practice, you you make the changes, you, you start hanging around like-minded people who always want to evolve and change. You go to the meetings, you get your sponsor, you work the steps, and that's the the illness is no longer an illness. You're just it's like that changes because you're not ill anymore because you've found this medication that's through actions, right? And these twelve steps are really the magic of it. And I always say, We are blessed. We have the key to life. But the key to life, those last three steps are the maintenance ones to maintain that because every day is a, a different day, different challenges that's thrown at us. And you've lived in it with your family and your husband. And so what, how can you speak to that of what you witness? And also I'm sure you're a big part of, of maintain, changing that mental illness to a recovery to a maintenance. I think what I've noticed is that understanding how good life is now and what is at risk to be lost should that slippery slope come into play and I think that that's been really huge for everyone that I know and and just a really positive motivation of like all could be lost in a second you know mm -hmm. and knowing what blessings you have and what gifts and and what an incredible life you may have no matter what your life looks like it's still better sober than it could ever be not sober and so you know when people sort of ask my husband like oh well do you miss it he's like no because you know I was a lunatic first of all but like <laughs> you know there's nothing really to be gained you might have like an easier social time some sometimes but that's about it there's nothing great that comes out of just going back gain. down that path yeah, yeah. exactly and so, you know, for exactly. us, we just know how great our life is. And we, half the time people are like, are you guys drunk? Because we're just having so much fun. But it's like, no, hey. no, we're just, this is seltzer water and we're mm -hmm. just loving life. And, you know, I think when you understand what could be lost, um, it's very easy to maintain, you know, the, the straight and narrow path because you don't want to lose those things that you've worked so hard for. And when you have people who are supportive of that as well, I think that's, that's really key. You're not ever in it alone. Um, and not, not letting a person on that journey feel alone either. You know, my husband is, you know, he, he fought professionally. He was at the, the top, literally the top of the UFC for years and years. And 
when people would come up to him and say like, hey, I'm a month sober or, you know, I'm a couple weeks sober, whatever it may be, he took the time to really talk to him about it or to reply to messages on social media. And, and I always just thought that was so admirable because he didn't have to, but it was important for him, you know, to remember how he felt in those early days and, and to not let anyone else feel alone either. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I love that. So, yeah, you know, it's so interesting because Leah has a 16 year old daughter and, you know, um, she's had to withstand the, the temptation because it happens, you know, like I was a good kid and addiction runs in my family. And then it was, it took one person to say, here, try this. And next thing you know, years and years of a mess. Yes. Um, but yeah, it just alters your mind. Like you think. It just alters who you are and it blocks you from a beautiful life, you know. And I noticed, yeah, like with my daughter, if she, you know, partied with her friends, you know, I, well, Sandy kind of pointed out, you know, oh, her eyes are a little hazy. I'm like, oh, she's just tired, you know. Or And so now I recognize the signs because I, you know, am not an addict and I didn't, you know, I would go out and drink socially, but I didn't really recognize. And um, I mean, it's night and day my child completely stopping um you know where her personalities now come to life and she's happy and you know it's just it's really sad how um addiction can really paralyze and destroy lives and families and relationships and and I do like to have a good margarita once in a while and I do like to have it's fine champagne <laughs> it's, she says it's fun um but at the same time, I love what you said. It made me actually kind of think today um, about that support. I know Sandy says, you know, she's fine. Like, it, it doesn't bother her, she says. But it's more than that, right? It's saying, I'm your partner. I'm with you on this journey. And if this is so important to you, I want it to be important to me as well. So if I had to give that up, you know, I would definitely consider doing that because I don't need to drink. But but I think it's she drinks beautiful. very little. I, like, I hardly drink at all. Like one a month. I'm maybe, so sensitive. If he, even that. Anyway, but I love the support. I, I love, love that, that you do that. Yeah, and thanks. We're I just want to thank you for coming on. Yeah, this has thank been you. Incredible, and I can't wait to meet you in person in yes. Vegas. Bravo Con, here we come. I cannot Let's, wait. Look, listen, if you want to put in a good word, I'm just trying to host a panel. I want. I'm whatever I can oh, do. Oh, you'd be yes. great. That's, that'd be awesome. <laughs> Uh, we could have like the sports uh, housewives. You could be the referee. You know, yeah, the, a referee be, of all the spikes in the elevator. I am the... ready. Okay, Melissa, do you really want to throw <laughs> that in there? Read up. Put those gloves on. <laughs> exactly. Um, Listen, um, I, I, I can come prepared for whatever you yeah. need. But you guys are great. Thank you for having me on. I really appreciate it. Yeah, you're yeah. such an inspiration, and thank you so much. Oh yeah. Much. So we gotta get we gotta exchange digits yeah, so we can definitely uh, see you in Vegas. Yeah, I can't wait. That sounds yeah. perfect. Well, awesome. thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) Thanks, guys. Thank you, everyone, for joining the Captain Sandy and Leah Ray Show. And if you haven't subscribed to our channel, we would so much appreciate your support. Just click the link above and subscribe and tune in. And we hope that you're blessed by our show. Thank you so much.